Good morning. My name is Mr. Cesar Chiva. I'm the chairman of Executive Forum España. Your Excellency is Jane Hardy, Australian Ambassador to Spain, Andorra, and Equatorial Guinea, Mr. Juan Miguel Villarmil, chairman, chairman of OHL Group, Secretary of State for Defense, Excellency Mr. Pedro Arguelles, ambassadors, members of the diplomatic corps accredited to Spain, distinguished guests of the business community, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank you all for coming to this informative breakfast at the Palace Hotel with the Ambassador of Australia. First, I wish to thank, I wish to take this opportunity to congratulate Ms. Jen Hardy for her appointment as the new ambassador at the beginning of this year. Spain is indeed a great country, a great country to live and to work. So I hope you have a great stay, a great time during, the, during your stay in Madrid. Uh, hopefully you have a lot of fun here. As on previous occasion, Mr. Juan Miguel Villarmir is the person who will introduce the ambassador this morning. This morning. It's a great honor for us, Mr. President of OHL Group, that you are present among us this morning. You are also the President of the Spain Australia Council Foundation, and I want to thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Your Excellency, the Ambassador of Australia in Spain, Ambassadors, Authorities, Ladies, Gentlemen, Dear Friends, we have all to thank the Ambassador of Australia in Madrid, Mrs. Jane Marie Hardy, for being here with us today. Thank you very much for being with us. And for me, it is big satisfaction as chairman of one construction group, OHL, to have this opportunity to sponsor this breakfast organized by the Executive Forum Spain, during which we are going to listen to you, the Ambassador of Australia, who is going to talk to us about the ASEAN century and Europe. The ASEAN century and Europe. I have to say that everything related with His Excellency Jane Marie Ardi is outstanding. It's outstanding the academic record you have. Because really, you are a bachelor and master's degree of arts and graduate diploma in foreign affairs and trade. You were from the beginning committed with your country and with the people of your country. And then even if really the ambassador is very, very young, but she has already 20 years of experience in public services supporting the interests of Australia. Before to present the credential here to King Juan Carlos, in the past month of February, February 2013, he was Assistant Secretary in the Strategic Affairs and Intelligence Division. And before that, he has been in different, always very important responsibilities, including to be under secretary of the Australian High Commission in Kuala Lumpur, to be advisor to the Australian Embassy in Seoul, advisor to the Australian Embassy in Washington, and under secretary in the United States Division. Always she did extremely well. Now I refer very briefly to Australia, to remember that Australia is a very big country with only 23 million of inhabitants, 
and with 7.7 .7 million of square kilometers, that means 15 times, 15 times bigger than our, in comparison, Little Spain. Australia is formed by a large continental land mass with several islands. The largest is Tasmania. Really, Australia is a big country of reference for being there and growing. It's characterized by a democratic and political stability with a very secure and respected regulatory framework. And from the economic viewpoint, the most productive sector in Australia is associated with raw materials, mineral, energy, and services. All that as the big sector for the future. It's very interesting to know that A.T. Kearney, the international U.S. consultant, does every year the relation of different countries in the world which it is interesting to invest. And they put a relation of near 200 countries. And Australia, in the last relation, and in particular, in the last one, 2012 relation, is the number six country in the world of biggest interest for direct foreign investment. It's interesting also to know that the economy of Australia has been always well managed. And then when we, European countries, we have suffered from 2008, the important financial crisis affecting the United States and more to Europe and more to Spain, Australia, all this year, has been able to go on growing about 3% in 2008, in 2009 to 2012, and this year, 2013, again, about 3% of growth on completely regular basis. Now, I refer briefly to the relation of Australia with Spain, in two moments. One, the historical, the past, because it is not well known that the Spanish sailors were going to Australia in the beginning of the 16th century. And that they were discovering all of the Pacific, including the south of the Pacific. And even today, in Australia, the Detroit between the land of Australia and the island of New Guinea has the name of the Spanish mariner Luis Baez de Torres, which is still the name of the strait. Then it was a, a sea for Spanish people centuries ago. Recently, we are very proud to have excellent relation with Australia and to be doing, all of us, the best effort to develop this relation. I have to say that I have the honor of being the chairman of the Australian-Spain Council Foundation to develop the relation between the two countries. And also, I have to say to you all that the introduction of our foundation in Australia in the past month of February has been, in my personal experience, I am very young, but you have already had experience, and <laughs> has been the event most important, more serious, and better organized that I have ever known. It was the moment of having shipped to Australia a big ship 
of the Spanish army built by Navantia, and it was the day of the naming, changing the name of the ship. In a very formal ceremony, where we had the privilege of having with us the Prime Minister of Australia, several ministers, all the top people of the Australian army, and also from the Spanish side, the Minister of the Navy, Mr. Morenes, with the undersecretary that accompanies us today, and with all the people of our Navy. But in an event, very formal, very serious, with top people and top level. We have to thank to you, Ambassador, your contribution to organize this presentation. And the same in the dinner we had the night after, with more than 300 persons, very formally dressed. It was black tie meeting. And really, it was with speeches, with declaration, and really making a serious contribution to the friendship and relation between the two countries. We are in the field of construction of infrastructure, <coughs> and really Australia being the paradise of raw material has to be also the paradise of infrastructure. And we are very interested to work there. We are in the beginning, as OHL, but we established our delegation in Australia in 2010, and now we are already working in two roads. One is near Melbourne, and the other is near Sydney. And really, we have to say that the reception that we have had in Australia, the relation with the government, with the authorities, and with the people, all the people of Australia, has always been the best. We thank you very much for your contribution, and in general, to Australia and the people of Australia. We have, all of us, the privilege of having an excellent ambassador, and then we are going to hear you now, Jane Marie, in your address about the Asian century and Europe. Thank you for coming. Buenos días. Primero, un poco español. Es para mí un gran honor y un placer compartir esta ocasión con el Marqués Juan Miguel Villamil, que durante los tres meses que llevo en España me ha enseñado muchas cosas sobre este maravilloso país. Su país es maravilloso. Muchas gracias. Now in English. <laughs> Necesito uh, practicar un poco, <laughs> mucho. In October last year, the Australian Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, released a major roadmap for Australian domestic and international policy titled Australia in the Asian Century. And today I want to explain Australia's view of our region and link this to the interests of Europe. This will not surprise you, Australia is located in the Asia region, as you can see. We are bounded by three oceans. We often think of ourselves or speak of the Pacific, but we have three oceans surrounding us. Despite a view of Australia by some as an isolated outpost of Britain, today one in four Australians was born overseas and our largest immigrant groups are Asian, European and Middle Eastern. Of our 23 million people, 10% speak an Asian language at home. Italian, Greek and Spanish are the three next most common languages apart from English, of course. And this diversity of our population is nationwide. It is not contained to the major cities. It is spread very evenly throughout the country. Australia's wealth, which now stands at US dollars, 67,000 per capita in 10, 2012, is ranked among the top five countries for quality of life. And this wealth also is quite evenly spread. 
Our ties to Asia were not so strong in the past. 40 years ago, Australia was dubbed the lucky country, and we liked the term for obvious reasons, but it was originally intended as a challenge to us. We were relaxed people. We, we were sun-loving. We were European in origin. But we needed to lift our game. We needed to reorganize our country. The idea was that we were rich and safe because of luck, not because of our hard work or our skills. Another idea which was common in our history was the tyranny of distance. The tyranny of distance is the idea that Australia began as a tiny settlement on the edge of an unexplored continent, far from Europe, but this too has changed. Our sense of vulnerability in the 19th and early 20th centuries has been replaced. We are now much more confident. Now we talk about the advantage of our proximity to Asia. In the 1950s, the Cold War came straight after the Asian Theatre Wars, during which time the Australian Territory was threatened and actually bombed. During the Cold War, the domino theory of the approach of communism drove our national politics. This lasted until the early 1970s. But in hindsight, it was communism. But it was the post-colonial nationalism throughout Asia which was a very powerful driver of change. And we believe it was a more powerful driver of change than the so-called communist threat. From that time onwards, the 1970s, we understood that Australia's security lay as part of Asia, not in keeping our distance. Australian security policy became open to the principles of common security that security is achieved with others, not against them, and the broader concept of cooperative security buffeted by our buttressed by our alliance with the United States became our modus operandi. And since that time, we have also transformed our society and economy. Our current wealth and stability is built on different planks. Firstly, our European heritage of law, democracy, and open trade. Secondly, our defense alliance with the United States. And thirdly, our deepening relations in the Asian region. Physically, you can see that our closest neighbors are Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, Timor-Leste, and New Zealand. I'll just quickly point out the Torres Strait. Explain in a minute. <laughs> With our distinct culture and historical experience, we're at home in a region which is highly, highly diverse. It has a profusion of distinct national cultures, histories, and very vast diversity. Since 1980, Australian trade with Asia-Pacific countries has vastly outp outpaced our trade with Europe and the Americas. Our top trading partners are in this order, China, the United States, Japan, the Republic of Korea, the Southeast Asian countries or ASEAN, and the European Union. We are or have negotiated trade agreements with all of these partners and we are negotiating a framework agreement with the EU. Strategically, it's clear to everyone that China and India are countries of global significance. We also wish to point out that Indonesia is emerging as globally significant, both economically and strategically. Australia's 2013 Defence White Paper was released on the 3rd of May. It affirms that Australia's partnership with Indonesia remains our most important strategic relationship Indonesia and Australia also work together on other serious issues on combat, combating people smuggling through a process known as the Bali process, on enhancing governance through the Bali Democracy Forum, and collaborating to counter terrorism. 
Similarly, Australia is one of only a handful of countries to have an annual leaders summit with China and we have a defence and military relationship with China which includes live fire exercises, one of the very few countries in the world that does that. We have a comprehensive strategic partnership with India and we currently lead with India the Indian Ocean Rim Association for Regional Cooperation. And we have very long-standing political and defence relationships with Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Papua New Guinea and New Zealand. So our interest in Asia does not simply stem from the remarkable economic growth which has occurred in the last 30 years. It also stems from our assessment that Asia is a region of strategic significance politically, militarily, and don't forget, in terms of intellectual output. Many of the world's leading ideas and advanced technologies are now coming out of Asia. South Korea and Japan have already have very enviable reputations for being global players in science and technological innovation. By 2020, think of this statistic, by 2020, Four in ten university graduates around the world will come from just two countries, China and India. Southeast Asia again, many of the countries of Southeast Asia have transformed their education systems. And uh, I was speaking to the Malaysian ambassador last night. I lived in Kuala Lumpur in the early 1990s when the leadership of Malaysia made some very important decisions and established world-leading university branches on Malaysian soil. And that has been incredibly important for Malaysia and for Australia. So how is this relevant to Europe? Well, of course, you will be aware uh, from your uh, corporate leaders like uh, Mr. Viamir that um, interest among uh, European business people and governments are growing, is growing very much um, in terms of the Asia-Pacific region. The number of Spanish companies in Australia is nearly 100, and many of those companies are also investing in other parts of Asia and Latin America. And my colleague, the Chilean ambassador, gave a very interesting talk at this forum last several weeks ago about that. I don't want to assert that this century will belong to any one country or region, economic weight and strategic influence are becoming more dispersed around the world. Some of the poles of power this century will of course be outside of Asia, but it is the size of Asia that's important. The size of Asia pop Asia's population means that it's likely to be unique in the scale of its economic growth. Asia is coming back to the preeminent place it had in the global economy at the end of the 18th century. One of the challenges of our time as Asia re-emerges as a world power is the critical task of building regional and global institutions. We need to understand that Asia has two characteristics of particular relevance. Firstly, Asia is a maritime domain. The sea is, for many Asian nations, central to their economic livelihood. The source of resources, of course, fish, minerals and energy, don't forget, and of course the means of transport and trade. For centuries before European colonisation, states in our region traded from China to the Middle East and down to the northern coast of the Australian continent. The colonial period redrew the map of trade routes and shifted the centre of global commerce for several centuries to the Atlantic Ocean. But the re-emergence of Asia has restored these older patterns. I don't know if you can see clearly on that map, but this is a calculation of a dollar value trade around the world and it has shifted down to the, the bottom right of this map. Uh, the the, um, the re-emergence of Asia has restored these patterns, the older patterns dating from the uh, 17th and 18th century, 
drawing links again between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. The crucible of Australian security is now the Indo-Pacific region. As this map shows, the Indo-Pacific is also of enormous relevance to Europe. The yellow lines show the, sh the shipping uh, straits of highest volume and intensity. Note the potential choke point of the Malacca Strait. I'll just quickly point this out. This is the Malacca Strait. It's a little hard to see. <laughs> Forgive me, but I love maps. <laughs> So note the potential choke point of the Malacca Strait. In this strait, which is very narrow, 50% of all global merchant traffic and around 80% of China's energy shipments pass through. 14, ma 14 million barrels of oil pass through the Malacca Strait every day. If this strait was blocked, nearly half of the world's fleet would have to reroute their, their shipping routes. And Europe, of course, has so much at stake in the security and stability of this region. Not least, US dollars, $860 billion of trade in North Asia alone, much of it transiting the Malacca Strait and the South China Sea. Given this volume of trade, clearly also, Europe matters to Asia, let's not forget that. In this map, the highest density shipping lanes are marked in red and you can see more clearly the geography of the Malacca Strait. The Indo-Pacific region includes Australia's top nine trading partners. It embraces our key strategic ally, the United States. It includes Japan, which remains a linchpin among our regional relationships. And it includes our largest trading partner, China. Importantly, it returns India to, a, a, to Asia's strategic mix. It brings in the big economies of Korea, Indonesia and Vietnam, as well as the diplomatic and trade weight of other ASEAN countries, which lie immediately to Australia's northwest. Again, the Southeast Asian region deserves special mention. Southeast Asia occupies a geostrategically pivotal position between the Pacific and Indian Oceans. It acts as a fulcrum for the rapidly intensifying exchange of goods, people and ideas between East, West and South Asia. And ASEAN is a block of 600 million increasingly affluent people. As our 2013 Defence White Paper states, Australia's strategic policy is framed by an understanding that Southeast Asia, which is economically strong, outward looking and militarily capable, is fundamentally in Australia's interests. The Pacific Ocean is home to five of the world's largest militaries and five unresolved disputes. The Korean Peninsula, which of course gets all the uh, media attention, but also the disputes in the South China Sea, the East China Sea, the Sea of Japan, and the Taiwan Strait. The Indian Ocean region has seen ancient and modern territorial and religious wars, of course. In addition, piracy, illegal arms trading, illegal fishing, narco-trafficking, people smuggling, these are all very long-standing problems in both oceans. Our region does not have a European-style regional uh, security mechanism, but it, in recent decades the Asian region has developed its own mechanism and ASEAN, again, the Southeast Asian nations have been at the centre of this. We have the, much to thank them for. Our future lies in building a robust global and regional order which can effectively manage major power relationships, achieving what the Indonesians have called dynamic equilibrium in which bodies such as ASEAN build trust and habits of cooperation in the wider region. Of course, the US-China relationship, more than any other, will define our strategic environment over the coming decades. 
we in Australia assess that a consistent US presence in the region will continue to be important to regional stability and confidence as it has been for the last 70 years. We also want to deepen our cooperative defence relationship with China. And we do not believe that we must choose between our alliance with, our, with the United States and our rapidly growing partnership with China. Asia is not Europe, it is larger and as, as I said earlier, it is actually more diverse, more, more numbers of languages, more ethnic diversity. It has a very different kind of history and dynamic. For the first time in centuries, the Asian region fe features a group of powers which are simultaneously strong, not just China, but also Japan, India, Indonesia and South Korea. More and more, we must all deal with the management of relationships in which economic interdependence sits on top of deeply entrenched strategic rivalry. Economic globalization has merged with a strategic map shaped by centuries of competition. We cannot afford, if we ever could, to look at economic and strategic questions in isolation. Established international law is fundamental to resolving specific dangerous cross-border disputes or threats to international order, but in our region, what we call the pacifying forces, the forces of democracy, of trade and commerce, and co cooperation to combat illegal activities, as well as social exchange, these are now among the most important drivers of peace and prosperity in Asia, which is such a highly interdependent region. This is the second defining characteristic which is important for us to, to understand. And this, as this chart of trade agreements shows, of course it's important for Europe. That chart actually showed a link to Europe um, which was very important in the trade dynamics. This chart here, however, is, is more simple. It shows some of our emerging uh, forums. This is economic forums in Asia. It, it shows the East, East Asia Summit. I don't know if you can make sense of this chart, but it, it covers the East Asia Summit, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Group, or APEC, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership involving ASEAN with their six FTA partners. Their six FTA partners, by the way, are Australia, China, India, Japan, South Korea and New Zealand. And the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is our newest uh, organisation. And I'll just briefly go through some of these to explain them to you. The summit is Australia's highest priority. Its 18 members account for 55% of global GDP and half the global population. Eight EAS members are in the G20 and three are permanent members of the United uh, Nations Security Council. The EAS has three main functions to grow regional financial and economic integration to build confidence and to nurture cooperation on security issues and to provide a vehicle for addressing issues like climate change, resource security, non-proliferation and terrorism. Why is this particular group so important to Australia? It's a summit. It includes, it, it involves the leaders of all our countries. It involves all the major regional powers, including the US and Russia and nothing is off the table in terms of agendas. It is very broad ranging. Our leaders therefore every year have at their disposal a tool to work very directly together on the most pressing issues of the day. APEC is more familiar name. It's an older group. Uh, for more than 25 years it's played a, an important role. Um, it's complementary to the EAS as well as to the World Trade Organization and the G20. As this slide shows, APEC accounts for more than 45% of to total world trade. Since 1989, APEC has fostered economic reform, good regulations, 
and collaboration on economic issues. Each year they have a leaders meeting also. The 21 leaders of the Asia Pacific come together and often they'll address regional security challenges as well as economic ones. In recent, uh, in the last 10 years, um, I worked on APEC a little and I can remember uh, the leaders got together at the time that the formation of Timor-Leste was taking place, a very serious and difficult time for our region and gave great support to Timor-Leste as it continued to es establish its identity as the world's newest country. The leaders have worked, of course, on the global financial crisis. They've also worked on very basic commercial issues such as cutting red tape, which affects the flow of goods around the region. The ASEAN Regional Forum also has been active for nearly two decades. It's chaired by an ASEAN country and it involves foreign and defence policy officials and other experts. And importantly, the European Union has a seat at this table. The foreign ministers of its 27 member countries meet annually. Recent work has focused on the Korean Peninsula, the South China Sea, disaster relief planning for the region, very important, our tsunami work, our collaboration on disaster relief for tsunamis and other uh, tropical storms in our region has forged a, a very deep links between our uh, non-military and our military um, disaster responders. Uh, it has also worked on other issues such as um, disarmament and challenges to stability in space. You might be interested to know that Australia and Vietnam co-chaired an ARF space security workshop in December and that workshop built support for the EU, the, a proposal by the EU to control the proliferation of space debris through an international code. This is how these organisations interlink with Europe. I just want to show uh, the ASEAN Defence Ministers meeting. Um, the ASEAN Defence Ministers meeting is the is the black no is the orange um, orange list. So there are two groups there. The larger list is the ARF, and then the smaller list is the Defence Ministers meeting. The um, the Asia-Europe meeting, or ASEM, involves 21 members, including Russia, and uh, we count Russia as an Asian power. It has an Asian coast, don't forget. <laughs> um, and 30 European members, um, plus the ASEAN Secretariat and the European Commission, so it's a total of 51 members. At annual ASEM summits, leaders discuss the cross-cutting global issues sustainable development, global economic governance, climate change, non-proliferation of uh, arms, particularly nuclear non-proliferation, transnational crime and irregular migration. For all of these processes there are non-government or what we call second track uh, bodies which contribute ideas, scholarship and recommendations to all of these government-led processes including the APEC Business Advisory Council, the Council for Security Cooperation in the Asia Pacific, and uh, the ASEAN Institutes of Strategic and International Studies, and the Asia Europe Foundation. The most recent of these regional groups I'll highlight is the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or the TPP. The TPP is a pathway for realising the vision of a free trade area of the Asia-Pacific. Countries negotiating the TPP are Australia, Brunei, Canada, Chile, Malaysia, Mexico, New Zealand, Peru, Singapore, the United States and Vietnam. The TPP is more than a traditional trade agreement. It will also deal, I think most business people will be interested to hear this, it will also deal with behind the border impediments to trade and investment. A lot of the regulatory issues which bedevil our trade unnecessarily. 
So after 25 years of this regional uh, uh, institution building, of building this architecture in our region, what is the scorecard? In this uh, picture, the Asian region output, economic output, is displayed in black. It has a very major role to play, as you can see. Capitalism, it's battered. It is a bit battered after the global financial crisis, but it is a very powerful, attractive force in our region. As prosperity has spread across Asia, so has the middle class, keen to take advantage of it. The company McKinsey estimates that up to 3 billion more middle class consumers, 3 billion more middle class consumers will emerge in Asia in the next 20 years. India's middle class will number more than 250 million people within two years. 250 million middle class people in India and Indonesia's middle class is already larger than the total population of Australia. On the democracy side, what's happened? Well, democracy has increased its reach in the Asia region and is consolidating strongly. India was a leader. India's choice of democracy from the time of its independence in 1947 was remarkable. Indonesia's democratic transition has been one of the seminal developments of the last two decades and very little understood outside the region. It has global in implications, not only for trade and commerce and economic development and human rights, of course, but also for strategic balance. India and Indonesia are among the fastest growing and most stable countries today. Indonesia is the second largest and Indo uh, sorry India is the second largest population in the world and Indonesia is the fourth largest population in the world. Indonesia is the largest Muslim population in the world. India is the third largest after Pakistan. But I, I think sometimes Pakistan and India are quite similar in terms of the size of their Muslim population. Looking at the smaller countries well, we have the emergence of the world's most recent democracies. Timor-Leste, uh, the creation of Timor-Leste as a, a, a strong democracy was very important. The p political transition in Myanmar, they, they augur very well for the establishment of democracy in our region. These changes were not sudden. They were the result of decades and decades of hard work and sacrifice by their own people. So we aim to ensure that these pacifying forces, the forces of commerce and trade, the forces of democracy, the forces of economic and uh, cultural exchange, uh, continue to work well in Asia. More than that, our Asian mechanisms that I outlined earlier are becoming vital to our future. They're having also a global impact. Other international bodies are transitioning. And I will say something quite controversial. I'm sure there might be some questions about this. The group of eight, the G8, the post-war group of the world's major powers, is ceding ground to the G20. As I mentioned earlier, eight East Asia summit countries are members of the G20. And they're shown here in orange. Financial institutions like the IMF, have made uh, institutional changes that recognize the new power relativities. But the IMF must go further in doing this. The Doha ro round of WTO negotiations, trade negotiations, is struggling. Climate change negotiations have not delivered the global action we need. And reform of the UN Security Council is as far away as ever. My point is that regional institutions such as we have in the Asia-Pacific and the Indo-Pacific will have globally a correspondingly greater role to play in fostering consultation and cooperation. Again, what does this mean for Europe? 
As I said earlier, most obvious for Europe is the opportunity for trade and commerce and investment in the world's most dynamic economic region. But what is less obvious is the picture of power being rebalanced. As Asia's combined economic weight grows, it is likely to surpass the economic weight of the United States and Europe combined very soon. And it will also therefore pose challenges to the existing global order. As Asia's economic dynamism is reflected, Asia's economic dynamism is reflected in its military spending. As I said to you earlier, we believe this is important for Asia, not a threat. Regional militaries will be much more capable than in the past. The consequences, though, of strategic miscalculation are potentially global in scale. The North Korean situation is the most obvious example, but there are other potential flashpoints. And the global domains, the areas for conflict <coughs> in the globe, include the traditional ones of territory, sea and air, of course, but now also cyber and space. Europe shares our interest in peaceful resolution of any territorial or other disputes in Asia. Peace in Asia, notably on our oceans and in cyberspace, will continue to under, underpin the growth which benefits us all. The rise of countries like China, Indo India, Indonesia, and of course, the uh, strong economies of Latin America, particularly Brazil, goes to the heart of our international system. Emerging powers have every right to seek greater strategic influence to match their e economic weight. But the extent to which this can be peacefully accommodated will turn on both the pattern of these countries' international behavior and the extent to which the existing international order intelligently finds space for them. There is in Australia today, of course, a sharper sense of the opportunities in Asia, but also the urgency that we need to build these comprehensive relationships within Asia, and that we use this window of transition in the region to build cooperation and inclusive regional institutions which can help to ensure that this transition is a stable one. This conviction was the, behind the drive, first articulated through the concept of APEC 25 years ago, and through our engagement with ASEAN, the Southeast Asian nations, to build prosperity. When I say our engagement, I mean all of us. I mean Australia, Europe, the Latin American partners, North America, and of course, North Asia. North Asia negotiating with Southeast Asia has been a very important driver of all of this dynamic. It was behind um, our support for the EAS to include the United States and Russia, and of course, behind our support for the ASEAN Defence Ministers meeting. Europe's involvement in Asia, to sum up, of course, is important to Australia. Almost 70% of Australians have European ancestry. 10% of our population was born in Europe. Each year, 1 million Australians visit Europe, 160,000 of them visit Spain. Half of those lose their passports in Barcelona. <laughs> But that's fine. Tourism is an incredibly important driver for these kinds of relationships, personal and commercial. And as a bloc, the EU is Australia's largest foreign direct investor. So Australia's welfare and prosperity are linked to Europe, even while our largest single country trading partners are now all in the Asia Pacific. My pictures show that just as Asia is different, also Australia is very different to Europe or North America. We have a strong identity, a different outlook. We were born modern uh, as a nation in 1901, benefiting from the modernizing infrastructure that the Brits, the British uh, built in our country, and now the Spanish are rebuilding. <laughs> 
We uh, have the world's oldest continuous indigenous culture, the Australian Aborigines. And we have a richly endowed but challenging continent. We have European roots, but very clearly an Asian trajectory. And we have a very long-term approach to engaging our neighbors in Asia, recognizing the transformative changes underway. Thank you very much. Yes, first of all, I want to thank Mr. Biarmir for his introduction. And then, of course, the ambassador for her speech. Brilliant. <laughs> Indeed. Now, we are having a brief session of questions for the next few minutes. Uh, ambassador for Australia, the benefits of being Asia next door neighbor are crystal clear, as you have put very well. Because of the similarity of the Australian culture and roots with those in Europe, would you consider your country as a fair option to enter a new market in Asia, even before China or India? Well, yes. <laughs> we would love to project ourselves that way. Uh, I think our Spanish companies in Australia, I met most of the Australian branch offices before I came to Spain earlier this year late last year and they do speak of that. The, uh, the familiarity with the European systems of law, yeah. very similar lifestyle, the ease of doing business is a great way to start. Several of them are big companies with pipelines of investments. They need to make sure their pipelines are continuous. If there is an area in their pi pipeline which is not active in Australia, they will look to our surrounding countries and some of them are doing that successfully. It's interesting to note that some of the big projects are actually in places you wouldn't imagine like Papua New Guinea and the Pacific Islands, again infrastructure projects there. Um, but I have to say many of your companies are very uh, well versed, becoming very well versed in the way of doing business in the Asian region and of course if there are big investments in China and India for example they must go direct to those governments and work closely with them um, but we're very happy to host <laughs> to host our Spanish friends in Australia yeah. uh, as they uh, move into uh, Southeast Asia Hong yeah. Kong and even China okay. um, Regarding Europe, there's been a lot of criticism about the immediate future of our continent, of our continent and the poor prospects for the next decades. From your point of view, from the other side of the world, but living here, do you think it's far, it's fair this assessment that Europe is a land or a continent in decline? I don't believe it's a continent in decline. I believe Europe has established a world order through the old colonial structures which have served us well. I know some have suffered under these structures but really we have all benefited from Europe's former world dominance. But the world is changing, it's now interconnected. You don't need to uh, see one part as in decline or the other in growth. Yeah. It, it, you know the United States and Europe has now embarked on a major uh, economic and trade pact. This is of huge significance to the world and we believe that this is a wake-up call. The dinosaurs are not dead. Yeah. Uh, we are all integrated and uh, as far as our economy goes it's so outwardly we have to trade. We're a trading nation and it's so outwardly oriented that it can only benefit us when Europe resurges and I think there are some positive signs. It, it will just take time. Yeah. And the main thing is you have good friends. We're standing by. Yeah. We're not deserting you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Imagine for a while that I am a businessman <laughs> and I want to settle in Australia. What piece of advice would you give me in order to succeed in your country? Well, uh, Juan Miguel would be best <laughs> place to answer this question. 
From, I deal with uh, a lot of people who are interested in investing in Australia or who are already there. And there are uh, several things I would say. Number one, uh, there is a strong regulatory system, but we believe it's very transparent. Mm -hmm. You must become very familiar with our regulatory system and also understand that our regional governments, our state governments, control many of the major projects. Um, they run public-private partnerships um, and for those kinds of projects you, you need uh, to really know who's who in each of the states and work with them. We have um, strict labour and um, health and safety laws but uh, many Spanish companies have become accredited and gained um, recognition as holding uh, very good credentials in terms of uh, health and safety. Uh, that's an important thing to, uh, to put in place. Um, thirdly, we have a series of visas. The most important one is called 457 business visa. It, it costs several thousand dollars and it takes anywhere from two weeks to several months to process but it's a very strong visa. It allows a, a great deal of activity. You can live and work and your families can live and work in Australia for two to three years. And we also have a short-term business visa which has become important, as, which uh, is a very new one. Um, as projects uh, roll out, sometimes experts are needed just for short periods. So this is a much quicker and cheaper visa and we've successfully been able to bring uh, experts in from Spain to work on some of the projects where we don't have local experts. So all of those factors are very important. One other thing I'd say, our dollar is far too high. Our dollar is a commodity dollar. Um, even though it, it's linked to commodity prices, but it in the last four years has become a safe haven dollar and it's far too high. The co that makes the cost of living in Australia high for Spaniards, very high. Uh, but, you know, commensurately, you will earn uh, a great <laughs> deal. As, as I explained, our GDP per capita and our average incomes are very high, but the, it will be a, you know, a shock to some, <laughs> yes. okay. especially the wages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Transition takes a long time and it's recently been finalised and consolidated and this happened very peacefully <clears throat> in a very orderly way um, and this China is to be congratulated on on this occurrence now I don't think that the way that the government structures in China which you must remember are built on centuries and centuries of uh, social um, structure and political structure they won't they won't become we we're very similar to Spain we have a very similar uh, the way the Parliament and the Congress operate and where the way the leadership uh, sits within that is very very similar but in China it will be always different to that which doesn't mean that it's not democratic or representative of its people and I think in the last uh, 10 years, 10 years ago uh, the, the ruling party of China for the first time allowed entrepreneurs as members of the party. This was a very significant move and now it's not even a question. The entrepreneurs of China are now among the leadership of China. It's not separated from the party. So uh, that, that's all very positive for us. Um, I think, you know, as I said, uh, to come to Australia, you must understand our laws and regulations. The same applies to China. China yeah. yeah, it takes a lifetime of study. <laughs> yeah. um, the last one, Ambassador, you know, it's a, as you said, it's a truly <laughs> epic journey traveling from here to Australia for a number of reasons, including the price of the tickets. <laughs> and the long distance. However, is the golden destiny uh, for many tourists. Do you think we'll have an increase in the number of travelers in both directions in the future? 
I certainly hope so. And uh, I think the airline companies that are servicing Spain and Australia um, are testament to they're, they're responding to demand. Uh, we have a number of uh, terrific carriers. We also have very major aeroplanes um, like the A380, which can now fly between Dubai and Sydney without stopping. This helps uh, our transport, uh, our experience of travelling a great deal. And believe me, Australians will flock to Spain. They're coming in huge numbers. Uh, last winter, I was sitting in a cafe in Canberra with the winter sun on my back, <laughs> and my husband and I were, were practicing our Spanish verbs. Oh, really? And then every, it, we were listening, every table around us. Someone had just come back from a holiday to Spain. Every table around us <laughs> in our winter, you see, you have a great advantage uh, <laughs> with the different seasons. Spanish going to Australia, we hope to have a new visa for young people mm -hmm. under 30 years of age. We've been working on this for some years. We're very, very much in favour of getting this visa. It would allow young people to stay in Australia for one year and to work, to work without a work permit. Well, it is a work permit. Mm -hmm. and uh, we call them backpacker visas <laughs> and when I was a young person I went to, in, to Bali <laughs> on a backpacker visa we've had them in place for many years and we sincerely hope that uh, we, can, uh, we can get this new visa okay. with the help of our friends from the Ministerio, Ministerio de Asuntos Exteriores <laughs> okay thank you very much so we must finish Ambassador I'm so delighted with your presentation here at this breakfast. Uh, it's been very comprehensive, entertaining, and informative. Uh, I really appreciate that. And thank you, you, for sharing with us this wonderful vision about Asia and Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you.